another series of lectures in data mining course. Um, today we are going to talk about linear regression lines. Um, we are first going to just work on the definitions of linear regression lines and then we are going to um, adopt some more advanced techniques on it and see how we can play with these linear regression lines. Linear regression lines are very simple approach in, in supervised learning. Why is it supervised? Because it always assumes you know the outcomes y and you have some predictors x1, x2 to xp and the relationship between them are linear. So it's a supervised learning because we already know the outcome y. So we are trying to use these predictors x1 through xp which are the features of our predictor to predict the outcome which is y. Um, in general, in general, true regression line functions are never ever linear. Um, so that's a very sad news for us because we, we usually want to work with truth but it's, it's usually not linear. You don't have any relationship that is linear except if you just simulate the data. So it seems a lot, uh, it, it seems overly simplistic to assume a linear function on different occasions but we, as we will see later, even though reality is not linear at all, it is sometimes extremely useful to use um, line to predict our, um, uh, to, to train our data based upon. So based on con uh, both conceptually and practically point of view, uh, linear lines seems to be an okay assumption or most of our cases. So, so m one of the things I have to share with all my students at the beginning of any um, session is that simpler the, be the simpler the better. I've written this so many times before. The simpler the better. So if you use a linear function and it works good, just keep it. Because you working with linear functions are extremely fine, specifically if you want to do interpre interpretation on your data. So some of the questions we want to answer all the time when you, you deal with linear regression lines is that is there any linear relation is there any re relationship between your y variables and dependent variables? Um, the example we used earlier was we wanted to predict y, which was sales, based on um, the amount of money you put on TV ads, radio and newspaper newspaper ads so so we wanted to predict that so so the first question we want to ask is whether there is a relationship between our sales or any of these advertising um, amount to be put so that's the first thing we should answer and in other linear cases we should we should ask ourselves whether there is a relationship between our predictors it can be anything on our response which is why um, which can also be anything if you're considering your research and if there is any relation between the two. The next question is how strong is this relationship? Um, is it a very weak uh, uh, relationship or a very strong one? How can we measure str strength of the relationship? The next one is which one of these variables here in this case TV, the amount of money you put on TV, radio or newspaper contribute more to our output which was sale? The next question is, can we predict our future sales accurately if we are working with new data sets or, or test data sets? Of course, one of the most important ones is whether this relationship is linear. If it's not, is it nonlinear? And if it's nonlinear, can we use a linear function to make that nonlinearity um, shape? And the last one is, is there any synergy among advertising in media? For example, one may say um, TV and radio ads are only going to be affected if the other uh, variable is present. For example, one may say TV ads are going to be affected only if you have spent so much money on radio or radio um, adver advertisement is uh, effective only if you have spent so much money on TV ads. So this is called the synergy effect. 
that is the relationship of two variables that go at the same direction and or in different direction in some some cases and you want to measure that as well so that is called the synergy effect that's if one variable is going to be effective only if the other one is effective or only if the other one is not effective so let's look at the visual representation of our data we have um, we have a response variable being uh, reported in, in, in correspondence to um, the amount of money we spend on TV, radio, and newspaper. As we can see, the slope of um, money we spend on TV is steeper than the slope that you see in radio and newspaper. So if we just look at this um, observation, we, we would may jump into the conclusion and say, it seems like spending money in TV is most effective. This hypothesis might be correct or wrong. We will see if it's correct or wrong later. And um, later on, uh, we, moreover, we will see that radio has also had an effect on our sales. Newspaper also had an effect on our sales, visually. But, but if there is any synergy here, meaning that, let's assume anytime you spend money on TV, a, a newspaper, any time you spend money on newspaper, you have automatically spent so much money on TV as well. So we know that TV is affecting our sale. Maybe the effect that we see in newspaper is caused by the amount that is already spent on TV. For instance, let's say we spend $500 on newspaper ads and $2,000 on TV. So, um, and, and we have sold, let's say, 13 units. Let's say whenever we spend $700 on newspaper, we have spent $2,500 on TV. And based on $700, that's the outcome we have there. That's $16 and so on and so forth. So as we can see, if there is a strong linear relationship between these two options, which is the amount of money you spend on TV and newspaper, even though um, the cause of sales might have just been caused by the amount of TV, money you put on TV. You may jump into the conclusion to conclude that newspaper has affected sales. So another thing that is important is to see whether, whether, whether we have such instances in our data. Maybe what we observe and, and visualize data is not, is not caused by causality. Uh, maybe there is some underlying things that we cannot observe just by looking at the data and that is causing the changes that we see. So in a linear model, the simplest linear model we have, uh, we have one y variable, one x variable. We have a bunch of um, observations like this. And we want to uh, find a line that describes these observations in the best way. So we need, in order to define a line, what you need, what you need is intercept and the slope. So we have to find true intercept and true slope in order to find this line. So in order to find the simplest linear model which only has one predictor x we need to find estimates of, uh, we need to find these two real values. But unfortunately, we do not have information about all population. Let's say this is the amount of money we spend on TV and this is our sales data. Well, let's say we only have access to 20% of our data. So we do not have information of all of our population. So it's impossible to get um, real beta zero and beta one. And that's why we are trying to estimate it by a model through our sample. So in, in reality, we want to estimate true linear models, but unfortunately, we don't have information of all observations. That is why we use estimates of our uh, some estimates of these coefficients to um, to predict something about reality. So whenever you see hat somewhere, or you see um, uh, or you see representation of them in Roman letters, that means we are trying to estimate that. That's, that is something you estimate. That is not truth. So in order to predict things, we have to uh, work on residuals. 
and residual is just the difference of what you predict based on your model and what you observe. So let me spend some time on this part. So let's say this is the amount of money we spend on TV. This is our sales. And these are our observations. So we have a bunch of observations and we want to find a line that describes them the best. Um, so th um, for every X, for every X, so let's call it X. Let me see if I can change the color of it. Um, okay, if print find properties, maybe somewhere document properties. No, it's not this one. Um, it sounds like I cannot change it. Should be a way to change it, but but let's work on this color. So let's say this is um, $5,000 expenditure on TV and this is your linear model uh, assume this is a line I couldn't draw a line perfectly I'm using a tab here it doesn't work perfectly um, so at this $5,000 this five th oh. as this $5,000 what are what we predict from our model is this much Let's say this is this is equivalent to um, 20 units of sale. So if we spend $5,000 on TV, what we predict is we have 20, 20 sales. So our y hat, which was a linear function on number of amount of money we spend on TV, which is in, indeed a function of the amount of TV we spend on TV is a function on five thousand dollars because that's what we try to predict sales on and we get 20 so our y hat was 20. however let's say at five we have an observation at five thousand dollars we have an observation at five thousand dollars here which corresponds to sales 50. so in reality what we observe in reality, what we observed at 50, well, as 5,000, sorry, is 50. The difference of these two numbers, which is y minus y hat, is called the error um, of my, my first observation. So here, we, the error is 30 units. We have errors here, we have errors here. We have errors here and we have errors for every single observation that we have. So if you add up these errors and you get the best model, you always get zero. So, so one thing we need to do is we sum these errors squared and try to minimize them. So we want to find, we want to find a line that minimizes this error. So we want to find beta zero and beta 1 such that such that um, it minimizes the differences of my observations and what you predicted for squared that is also called summation of EI squared if you just write the formula for y hat that is summation of all of my observations y is y and y hat was to remind you beta 0 plus beta 1. So let me put an index i. That means for every single observation we have, uh, we want to we want to minimize minimize the distances of our real outcome from what you predict for it and the one that can minimize it, the beta 0 and beta 1 that can minimize it are called the least squared model. Least squared coefficients coefficients okay so so that's our goal so we are trying to minimize these residual summation of residuals squared and residual is just the difference of what you observe and what you predict your model for so in 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 general you want to minimize the residual sum square which is 
which are the summation of errors squared. So summation of R squared for all of my observations is this. Uh, it's, is this. So my first observation is different from what you predicted for, uh, because for, for, let's say for TB500, you just put um, the estimates of your coefficients you have here, you get the prediction from it. It's beta hat 0 plus beta hat 1x. 1 is basically what you predict for x1 and so on and so forth. So you just want to minimize that. And it's not hard to show that uh, the the the, um, the coefficient that come from minimizing this RSS is this. Uh, I had a one dollar challenge for you. That means if anyone who can prove it to me, um, prove the fact that I'm going to discuss later to me, will receive one dollar reward. And that is, you can sh if you can show that beta hat 1 in one dimensional case is coefficient of determination times standard deviation of your y variables divided by standard deviation of your x variables. So this is equivalent to this. So any the first person who can show it to me receive $1 bill. And once you find beta hat 1, it's very easy to ha find beta hat 0 by knowing mean of your response variable, mean of your um, independent variable and since you have find beta hat here, you just replace it here. What this line suggests is that um, is for, for different values of x's and y's, let's say we have this mm, let me put this here, oops shoot uh, okay good um, so let's say this is X this is Y so the mean of my X is here is this part so we have some X's from here to here and it's relatively uniformly distributed so X bar is here the mean of my Y's are spread from here to here so Y bar might be um, Y bar might be this line so the intersection of these two at this point what it says, what, what this part says is that no, your, your best model will always cross that point. That means this point will satisfy this linear relationship. So, so in general, uh, let's work on the advertisement error, uh, ad ad advertising, um, um, advertising uh, relationship of TV and the amount of sales you have for every single amount you spend on TV ads you have an observation these red ones are representing our actual observations so the differences of what you predicted for which is in this blue line and your observation at each point is error so this is my first error this is my second error and so on so forth let's say we have 200 observations that will be my 200th error the best blue line that we can find is the one that minimizes the summation of these errors squared. Um, one of the things that uh, we should consider, and that that's that's a flaw of this simple linear model here, is that as you can see, the the, the variance of your observations increases as number of TVs increase. The spread of my data around my linear line. Increases that is called heteroscedasticity in um, statistics, and we should take care of this problem later. But uh, one thing I want to mention that is that um, using simple linear model here is not too appropriate. We should use GLS. Uh, another thing that is important when you find the models is that we have to know how much error we make. As I told you earlier in this course, we are interested to find beta 0 plus beta 1x but unfortunately we cannot find beta 1 and beta 0 because these are from my population that's why we find um, sample coefficients from it but one of the questions we should answer is how close we are to reality and and where is beta 1 let's say you estimate so let me let me use 
let me use this. Let's say, let's say you've estimated that beta hat 1 is 1, but when you build up 95% confidence with that, you say, beta 1, my reality, with 95% confidence, is somewhere between minus 2,000, and let's say uh, 100, uh, 2002. That's a terrible prediction. It's the the value the range of values you get for beta beta one is so large because that's only one point of estimate. So based on that, you have estimated this, and compare it to the another case that you find that beta one belongs to uh, with ninety nine ninety five percent confidence belongs to this um, this interval. That's a very good prediction in contrast to that. So we should know how close we are, how, uh, what can we say about reality. And in order to do that, we need to find standard deviation of our estimate, which is called standard error of estimate. And that is how you compute it. So, so basically, you need this to be as small as possible. And the way you calculate the standard error of, that is the variance of your estimate. If you take a square root of that, you get standard error is equal to your irreducible error simple error divided by a function of variance of your um, spread of x so what what you have in denominator says what is my variance in x so as you can see so that's that's that is actually n minus time uh, this is actually n minus 1 variance of your x. So what it shows that when variance of x goes up, when variance of x goes up, the result is the standard error goes down. So, so what does it mean? It says, ideally, in order for our linear model works in the best possible way, we want to have more variance in x and more variance in x with more spread of data. So let's compare these two cases. This is my first model and these are my observations. We have a lot of observations but but as you can see they're not spread that much. So finding a line that describes it might be very tricky from one case to another case. So all of them will satisfy this line. They're almost closed. If we just choose another sample, that are, the, the result we get would be different. But compared to the case that you have very, um, very spread data. Here from sample, to, sorry, and uh, that that wasn't the correct. Uh, that wasn't the correct. Uh, the, dismiss this line. From sample to sample, if you choose the, the results you get for your linear line, will be very close. So ideally, we want to have this spread of data on x, and the way you can measure this spread is through variance of x. So the point I wanted to make, and I hope I made clearly, is that ideally we want to have smaller variance here, a uh, larger variance here. Uh, and by having larger variance, we make sure the variance of this estimate will be as small as possible, and that means the interval we get is as large as possible, uh, as small as possible. And that's the same thing for standard error of beta hat zero. Um, again, you have this variance part here. Usually you cannot do that much about n that is that is fixed in your sample. Uh, it's always um, it's always better to have a larger sample size, of course, but usually you cannot control that. Since we cannot control this part, uh, we are heading to work with this variance so we, we, we ideally we want to have um, larger variance and more spread of the data so if we have these estimates and we have large enough n more than 30 n then the stand, uh, we can say that with 95 percent uh, chance the true beta 1 will belong the true beta 1 belongs to this interval beta hat 1 plus minus 2 times the standard error of beta ideally you do not want to have 0 in it and that's something that, that
that is extremely important to remember. So there is an approximately 95% chance that true beta 1 will belong to this interval. And that, that, that is how accurate our model is. We cannot be more accurate than that. For, for instance, for this add data, we are 95% with 95% chance the truth intercept of the relationship of TV and TVS and sales in between 0 0.042 and 0 0.053. That's a very good interval. If this interval is between minus a negative 0.10 to let's say um, to let's say 0.15 or 0.2, it, it will it will be very bad. So one of the things we can play around with is running some hypothesis tests on our coefficients. And, and the first hypothesis that is that we, we are interested in running is whether there is any relationship between x and y. So let me uh, remind you, we have this part. Beta 0 plus beta 1 x, right? If beta 1, if beta 1 is equal to 0, then that means y is only has nothing to do with x. So if there is any if there is not any relation between x and y, h0 will become beta 1 is equal to 0 versus alternative hypothesis which says it's not equal to 0. That if it's not equal to 0, that means there is some relationship between the two. Um, so so that, that is repetition of what I wrote on uh, earlier. To do that, we have to run out with something called t-statistic, and t-statistic is just ratio of your estimate, ratio of your estimate, and the standard error, you have to compare it with n minus 2 degrees of freedom in, on t table. But as a rule of thumb, usually when, t, when n is more than 30 and usually 10 is more than 2, then you reject your null hypothesis. Otherwise, uh, at significance level uh, 95%. So at significance level 95%, you reject your null hypothesis, that means your model is okay. So ideally, in most of the practical cases, you want this T be more than 2. But that's that's an incorrect, uh, that is not a scientific thing, that's a practical thing. Um, um, if you need more advanced things, you just need to look at the outcomes of the model and just use that. Um, it gives you the T and minus 2 uh, test statistic, and it tells you what is the p-value. The p-value is... Um, is given that your null hypothesis is true, that means it's zero. What is the probability that you observe such an odd, um, odd intercept? And you want this p-value to be as small as possible. Usually when p-value is less than 5%, you're fine. Again, that will be a, an outcome of most of the software, so you don't need to worry too much about it. For instance, in the TV ad part, um, uh, we have the coefficient is 0 0.0475, so beta hat 1 is this much. This is standard error of beta hat 1. So if we divide 0 0.045 by 0 0.0027, we get 17.67, which is significantly more than 2. And with p-value almost equal to 0, uh, almost close to 0, um, that is correct. So that, that means TV was a significant variable, so we should keep it. Another thing that is also very important is to see how well our model is doing. And, and one way to see how, your, how good your model is, is through using R squared. R squared measures, so let me spend some time here. R squared, let me make this smaller. Okay. So. <coughs> R square measures how much of of <coughs> I'm sorry of the variability of your variability of your of your data is captured 
for your linear model. Linear model. And I have to emphasize on the linear part. That's extremely important to remember how much of the variability of your linear model is captured. If you're working with nonlinear model, you cannot use R square measure. If you use the formula for R square that I'm going to give you now in nonlinear cases, you may get something uh, stupid and strange. For example, you may get R square more than 100% or less than 0%. Um, so be very careful when you when you want to use R square. And the assumption here is let's say we have these uh, points. You should first ask yourself what is the stupidest thing I can do? Let's say we want to find TV and sales. The most stupid thing that we can say is that TV has nothing to do with sales. That's the most stupid model we can get that always predicts the mean of your outcome. So this is sales bar. So it says for every value of TV you ask me, I'm just going to predict your sales to be the average sales of that uh, we have. So for example, you tell me, I haven't spent $500 on TV ads. What do you expect me to sell? And I would say 50 units. You say, how about if I spend $10 million? And you say, again, I say 50 units and so on and so forth. So that I, I would just reply to you by the average value of sales. So that's the, that's the worst thing we can do. That's the least we can do, actually. So it, given this model, given this model, we have some distances between what do you predict, which is Y bar, that was sales bar, which is also called Y bar, for every single observation. So, so the, the, the error we make, which is called total sum square, which, is, which comes from my most stupid model is summation of differences of y bar minus my observations squared. That is, that is the least we can do. In contrast, we can have a line that describes it and then we focus on the errors that are, that are here. Um, these are errors, are the errors that are, okay, so let me try it. So the difference of our linear model and our observations is also um, the amount of error that is left. That is my observations minus what I get from my predictions squared. So this is the amount of error that is left. That was the amount of error that I began with. Let's say, let's say, Total sum of square means your total error was 500, and you were able to cap. And and after your model, you're 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 left with 200 error. So let's see how what percentage of variability is captured by your linear model. So how much did we capture? Is 300. From these 500, we captured 300 of it through our linear model. How much was our beginning error? 500. So how much of the variability was given? was being um, being captured is 60%. So R squared is basically TSS minus RSS divided by TSS. In other words, R squared will be 1 minus RSS divided by TSS. So where, where did we get TSS? TSS is the differences of our observations and mean squared, that's, that's the least we could do. That was the error we started with. RSS is the error we are left with based on our linear model. And so the, 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 the ratio of what is left, uh, what we captured and total uh, sum square is called R square. Ideally, you want to be as close to 1 as possible. Uh, in simple terms, R squared, which is which is called also co coefficient of the de determination, coefficient of determination, determination, sorry for my handwriting, is equal to small r squared. r is called correlation coefficient. So for simple linear case, when you only have 
one variable this uh, relationship holds r square is equal to r squared uh, r is a measure that shows how linear your data is the closer r is between negative 1 and 1 um, the closer it is to 1 or negative 1 the more linear your model is and um, if it's perfect with the line and a positive way is 1 so this r is equal to 1 if it's perfectly linear in a negative way is equal to negative 1 so r squared is r squared for for just simple linear regression line and you can use this formula to show the earlier dollar bill challenge I put on online so the next thing that um, uh, so so here for our TV ad is R square is 61% 61.2% it's not bad um, I, I talk about that statistic later so usually you are interested to know um, usually you have more than one variable so you have many variables for example in the case of sales data we want to find what is the relationship of sales the amount of money we spend on TV radio and newspaper so we have these values simultaneously so how do we interpret beta 1 beta 1 is the average effect on sales based on a unit increase on TV holding everything fixed so so beta 1 let's say beta 1 is 2 let's say it's 2 so that means for every dollar we spend on TV fixing the amount we spend on radio and newspaper we, ex we expect that sales go up by 2 units so that's we should be very careful first of all to treat it this way because usually usually I better say most of the times you cannot assume fixing everything else you usually change when you change one variable the others will be changed so let's work on some very famous codes here um, one of the things is we must be able to fix other things when we use it otherwise um, we are doomed. Uh, one of the problems is when you change one variable, other things will change. So we cannot say that 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 well. Another problem with this interpretation is usually the variance of all coefficients tend to increase dramatically when you increase something. So we should be very careful to interpret beta j's. We should have balanced design. That means we should have small changes in variability irrespective of each other each of the variables to be able to do that and and the last thing we should be very careful is claiming causality do not say this is causing this just by this linear model one of the number one error i see in um in empirical studies is claiming causality just based on a simple correlation in the data So my one of my favorite favorite quotes from Mosler in Turkey, 1977, in, in the data analysis and regression is: a regression coefficient beta j estimates the expected change in y per unit change in x j with all the other predictors fixed, but predictors usually change together. <laughs> so this assumption is violated at the beginning. So let's work on some of the examples. For example, if you just regress the amount of money and amount of change you have in in your pocket based on the number of coins and number of pennies, you will see that you may get a negative coefficient for number of pennies. That may suggest the more pennies you have, the less change you will have in your pocket, which is absurd. Or another favorite thing that we can work on, and actually I'm going to uh, work on it in, um, in a bit, is if you record number of tackles by a football player in a session based on its weight and height what you will get is a negative coefficient for height that that may suggest that if you fix weight uh, if you fix weight for an extra inch in height the, the propensity of tackle decreases by my negative point one that is absurd why because you cannot fix weight and increase height at the same time 
so let me work on this example um, in, 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 in the next slide. In the next slide. So let's say, uh, so this is my original uh, regression line. Let's say y, the number of pack, you estimate the number of tackles that are being made by football players is 200 plus 0.5 weight, maybe 0.1 h. But as we all know, h is a function of weight. So your height, sorry, your weight is a function of your height. So let's say this is the function of form. So your your weight is 120 pounds plus, let's say for football players, it's uh, point three times height. So let's rearrange this. So y hat is 200 plus. I just replaced w, the w we had earlier. It would be 0 0.5 times 120 plus. 0.3h plus negative 0.1h. So y hat will become 200 plus 60, which is 260. We have 0.15h here, negative 0.5h here, so we get 0 0.05h. So we see the same model give us a positive coefficient for h, which makes sense. So the reason it happened was that weight and height were going in the same directions. Another favorite uh, quote here is by George Box. He said, essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and another interesting quote is, the only way to find out what will happen when you change a complex model, when you change one variable, is just changing that one variable in that complex model and see what will happen when you actually can't fix other things. Not merely passively observing what will happen. So let's work on the multivariate thing. Anything else in multivariate thing is the same as simple linear regression. You're trying to minimize residual sum square from the differences of what you predict and what you what you what you predict and what you observe. And your prediction comes from a larger function. Now it's a linear function of most of the variables. So you let's just replace Let's just replace this part to y hat, and what you get is the negative sign will affect this, so it will be y i minus y beta hat 0, 1, beta hat 1, x1, and so on and so forth. So you try to minimize this RSS by finding the, the correct beta 0, beta 1, beta 2 to beta p. It doesn't have a nice closed work solution that we had before. It has it in matrix format, which I shouldn't describe it in this textbook. But it doesn't have a nice um, vectorized uh, result that we got earlier. And, but the intuition behind it is the same. So let's say this is the amount of money you, uh, th this is the amount of your sales based on TV ads and radio ads. So the linear function in three dimension is just this uh, surface, this plane. In order to find the best plane, you have to find a plane that has the smallest distance of your observations and your predictions. So for example, for, for this point, um, let's say for this point, um, uh, this is my y variable, this is my, for this point, we have a, this x2. And this x1, and this is our prediction, let's say 500 prediction. What our model predicts is this much. So the differences of the two is your first error, and so on and so forth. So you want to minimize, minimize this error. So here we should just focus on the outcomes of our software. And let's say here are our software outcomes. For every single value we have, TV, radio, and newspaper, these are the coefficients we get. We get the negative coefficient for newspaper, which may suggest that the amount of money you spend on newspaper will actually decrease your sale, which doesn't make any sense, but let's see why. 
And here, we, if we just divide coefficients by standard errors, we get t-statistics, and here are my p-values. As you can see, the p-values of two of my coefficients, tb and radio, are highly significant. That means radio and tb were actually changing things. But the p-value of the newspaper is absolutely absurd. It's 0.85. It's close to 1. That means it doesn't have any predictability, so we should get rid of it. The other thing we can we should look at is the correlation coefficient of variables when you learn linear models. One of the dangerous things we see here is are are these very um, uh, uh, sorry not these uh, let's see okay newspaper okay so this coefficient this coefficient is very dangerous. It says the radio and newspaper are highly correlated and that may screw our results. So if we want to consider TV and radio, uh, radio and newspaper simultaneously, we should be very careful to interpret the results. So one of the simplest questions we can ask ourselves um, when you have a linear model is, is there at least one of the predictors that are meaningful? If all of them are meaningless, then my model doesn't mean anything. So this, is, this was my model. This, this was my model, 3x3 plus beta pxp. So if all of these values, beta 1, beta 2, up to beta p, are simultaneously equal to 0, then I'm screwed. So, so one of the things we should check is whether um, our hypothesis is equal to zero or not. Uh, all of the evaluators are not equal to zero. Equal to zero or at least one of them is not equal to zero. We should have at least one of them is not equal to zero. The second question we should ask answer is do all predictors help to explain why or some of them are useless? If it is, then we should only use subset of the predictors. The next question is how well does the model work? Um, the next question is how how much predictability your model has? Does it have a lot of predictability, or or it's not that it can be used for predictability? The way you can ask yourself uh, whether your model is significant or not is running this test. If all of these values are equal to zero simultaneously, versus at least one variable is meaningful, is different from zero, from zero. And the way you do it is through something called F statistic. This F statistic have two degrees of freedom. P is number of predictors. And N is number of observations. Um, I'm not getting into too much detail of it. What I want you to remember is that um, the software gives you this if a statistic, and usually you want, to, you want it to be as much as possible. And it comes with a p-value. This pa you, you ideally you want this p-value to be very small, less than one percent or five percent. So, uh, the next question that we need to answer is: um, all of um, are there are all of our variables? meaningful or some of them are meaningless which combination of our variables are meaningful one way to do it is called all subset selection so so let me explain it in a bit so let's say you have four variables you have four variables let's say this is your sales this is number of amount of money you put on tv radio newspaper so on and so forth so you want to see which one of uh, which combination of these variables are the best. So one of them, one way to do it is called all subset selection model. And that is how it works. So you first work on best one variable model. So let's say you're working on R square, you want to you do the following. So you you just write uh, you you just find this beta one based on only variable one. 
beta 0 plus beta 1 x2 and you repeat it all to beta 0 plus beta 1 x4 then you choose the best one let's say this is my best linear model based on one variable so how many models did I check? 4 um, so you choose this let's call it m1 that is the best model which has one variable the next thing we need to do is to work on all two variable cases so y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 that is one two variable model the other one is beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x3 and if you can continue it all to the case that you compare um, only you only work on x3 and x4 let's say we choose this model so this is m this is called m2 you basically need to consider two out of four models in order to find the best two variable subset model and to remind you it is 4 times 3 divided by 2 so we need to work on six models to get that and you do this for three variable models and also four variable models so you get m1 m2 m3 and m4 you find the best model based on r squared and then what you do is you use your test set your cross-validation set later I will explain what it is on these models you get a function like this you choose the, the test set that uh, brings in the least variable model so best model that we choose would be let's say this is this corresponds to M2 so our the best model we choose would be the two variable model with this many variables we uh, with x1 and x3 so one thing I want you to remember is that this is a very computationally extensive thing, specifically if you have very large values, variables. Uh, to be more precise, for one variable case, uh, when you want to, uh, so if you have p predictors in total, for one variable case you choose one from p, for two you choose two from p, and you have to do it up to p from p and it's not hard to show that that is 2 to the power of p for example if you have 20 variables you need to find 1 million linear models to choose the best one from if you have 30 variables you need to find 1 billion if you have 40 variables you have to find 1 trillion and as you can see this this is this increase this exponentially so it's not feasible to work in more than 30 or 40 variables computationally 30 is fine I've used R to work with 30 variables and it did it in a second in a couple of seconds but 40 is is large 50 is impossible to deal with so that is called best subset selection um, so so it's extremely hard and uh, is extremely computationally extensive so we should be able to do it in an easier way. The next way to find the best subset selection is through using forward selection. Forward selection and backward selection are essentially two sides of the same coin. So let me use forward selection and teach you that and you will be fine with the other one. Forward selection. In forward selection the first step is you run all linear models with one variable. and you choose the best best model so let's say m1 which is my best linear model is the one that has second x um, second predictor in it in second step you fix one of them that means you fix x2 and then add other variables that are that are there one by one so this one this one, this is my first model, second model is uh, actually x3 up to beta 2 xp and you choose the best model with two two variables where x2 was chosen so let's say you choose x2 and x3 so in next model you just fix x2 and x3 and you want to find the, the next 
variable that make them better and you do it over and over again on, until you get to the p-value and at the end you will be left with in the p-th step you will you don't have any other choice you have other already chosen p minus one values and the only model you you can work on is this one so here I had p options I run it p here I had p minus one linear regressions at the end I had only one option so in total in total you will have p plus p minus one plus up to one in total you have p times p minus one over two so it's p squared over two minus p over two so if you have 40 variables the number of time, the number of computational time you need is 1600 divided by 2, which is 800, minus 40 divided by 2, which is 780. So as you can see, for 40 variables in, uh, oh, by the way, when, when you're done with your best of selections, uh, forward selection in every single observation, then you again run the test variable prediction, and you choose the one that is the best. So as you can see, in this case, we only left with 780 um, observation, uh, runs of regression for 40, 40 variables, whereas in um, all subset selection, we were dealing with over 1 trillion subsets. So that if you want to work on something clever, it's always better to work on forward selection if you have more variables because it's impossible to work on uh, best subset selection. Okay, and the next case is backward selection. Backward selection is actually the same as forward selection. The only exception is that you start with a model with all your variables in. That's the first thing you do. Then you are trying to drop the least significant one, and you continue that uh, until the case you, 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 you'll be left with only one variable. And then you again run your test model and choose the best best one. Um, in chapter six of your textbook, which is not part of the curriculum of our first data mining course, but I have the videos for that, you will see how which um, which criterion you should use in order to um, use the best model when you you've already found the best. Uh, let's say in forward selection model, you found M1, which was the best linear model with one variable, M2, best linear model with two variables, and so on and so forth. So uh, well, I stopped the course here. Uh, we continue next time. Thank you for your attention.